Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, now, the text I will be discussing today uh, insists on the primacy of church law and is an important piece of evidence for the central role of the early medieval Irish church and its institutions in the compilation of the early Irish law texts uh, of all varieties, whether specific pieces of legislation, such as Coin Adhavnan, or texts describing what the law is, whether in Latin, such as the Collectio Canonum Hebronensis, or in the vernacular, uh, such as the Shanachasmo. And texts then in the vernacular can be in straightforward uh, expository prose or rhetorical texts, such as the text in question here today. It is of relevance to a number of important issues in the ongoing debate on the nature of early Irish law, and it is as a small token of respect that I offer this contribution to Fergus Kelly, who has done so much in the course of his scholarly career to advance our knowledge of this difficult and fascinating field. Now, uh, the handout uh, is in two parts, A and B. Uh, a consists of a, a, a transcription of the text as it is in the, the manuscript uh, and uh, uh, reproduced in the Corpus Juris of Ernike, to followed by extracts, citations from this passage elsewhere. Then you have an edited text and in boxes the uh, translation, right, so that the translation and the original text are beside each other. Uh, and then the other part is the secondary handout. Um, and for the, to begin with, I'll be using handout B. Right? We'll come, come to the text uh, uh, in a while. Uh, now, there is handout B then to begin with. Uh, there's only one complete copy of the Breath of uh, Toysach, and this is in the British Library manuscript Nero A7. It was written in AD 1571 by Maha Ullainin uh, of Arda on the Erin in County Fermanagh. The text itself, of course, is much earlier and can be dated to the 8th century. Um, and on the handout there, item number one, uh, there's some discussion of it in the, my companion to the Corpus Juris of Ernike. And I've also previously edited the first third of the Breath and Evans Toysach um, in area volume 40. Uh, the text is, for the most part, written in the difficult rhetorical style known as Ruskell. Uh, the inherent difficulties of interpretation are made even worse by the mixture of older and later orthographical systems employed by the scribe. And I've given some examples of some of the, the really exotic uh, uh, orthographical forms that you get in this text in the article in Eru 40 on page 3. Uh, the text, like the Shanach Asmar, and this is hardly a coincidence, has a tripartite structure. Uh, the first part is concerned with the church. Uh, the second is mostly concerned with poets, and the uh, passage that I will be looking at belongs to the final third, uh, which is concern concerned mainly with judges and judgment. Uh, the text Breath and Abbot Deitanach, which contains the first two elements, the same two elements, so it's the first Breath and Abbot and the second, the final Breath and Abbot, uh, is how you can render those, uh, is a separate text and is concerned mainly with the poets that are mentioned on the handout uh, number one. Now, uh, a large part of the Breath and Eveth texts uh, concern legal issues which are not covered in the surviving, and I stress surviving, uh, law texts written in straightforward expository prose. Thus, for example, the status and functions of the learned orders are dealt with here in far greater uh, detail than in any other source. Therefore, in order better to gain an understanding of these texts, it's essential that we first try to work out the key features of the rhetorical style. And clearly this is best approached by beginning with those passages where the subject matter is more familiar, that is, passages which are concerned with legal topics which are comprehensively treated in the surviving prose texts. Now, a good example uh, is item number two on the handout. Of the convoluted style of these rhetorical passages is the extract on the handout from a longer passage on the seven grades of poets, also from Breath and Eveth Toysach. It concerns the retinues of poets, that is, the number of people a poet can take with him on various occasions when he is maintained as a guest. Uh, we can first look at how this information is presented in a prose text, namely, Orekech uh, Nariyar. I cite the paragraphs dealing with the two highest grades, the Olive and Onroth. And you have in your hand out there the, the text and translation, so 20. 24 people for an Olive when engaged on public business. is a smaller retinue, 12 when pursuing a claim, 10 at feasts of hospitalities, and 8 on a circuit with the king. And similarly, then, you get the uh, figures for the, the onward. He's got 12, you know, half the, the retinue of the olive uh, for him in official business, seven and, uh, and four. Right. Now, uh, this is a fairly straightforward list of figures. Not so the rhetorical passage, which gives the first set of figures, that is the figure for the retinue on official business, 
for the olive and the onrus, which is I have here contrast breath and evit toshach. You can you have the text there in translation. Take heed that not every dignitary shelters twelve persons. An olive shelters amply, and an onrus whose honor price is ten cows does not protect them. And other ten persons and an ample two, as the dew of an olive, assert that an onrus does not protect protect them. O modern. Right. Um, this is in the form of address to the mythical um, uh, prehistoric jurist uh, uh, modern. Now, uh, the information we are concerned with here is no more than a list of numbers of persons in a poet's retinue on various occasions. Yet not only are these fairly banal data dressed up in the most complicated wording, but nowhere is it explicitly stated that the retinue of the olive is 24, rather, and, and that, that that of the all nurse is 12. Rather, this is something which the reader must work out from the information provided. Thus, the first three lines say, state that not every dignitary protects 12 people. The remaining lines say, essentially, that the olive protects 12 more people than the onrath. This provides the minimum information needed to deduce that the onrath has 12 and the olive has 24. Now, uh, it's also, well, as I say, that, that's complicated uh, uh, enough. Uh, it's the, uh, an example of the complexity in wording is the repetition of all in the second sentence. Um, you have there, this nev all of all, dechenberg um, alle aldius. Um, uh, and in the case of Disnev, all of all, uh, and all of protect shelters amply or protects. Uh, a person in your, in your retinue, of course, is under your protection. Right? So uh, instead of saying simply he has 12 people in his retinue, it says he has he shelters or protects 12 people. Um, so the word all of then, Disnev, all of all, is a reworking of an etymological gloss, which I give there again towards the bottom of uh, uh, item two in the handout from Cormac's glossary. All of. Uh, that is, great his retinue, the 24. No, all of uh, great, amply he, uh, he protects. Uh, that is, it is ample, that which he protects, i.e. 24. Right. So all, this nev, all of all, is, is a working of an etymological gloss. And uh, to a large part, you could say that the uh, second sentence, beginning with this nev and all of all, is an extended etymological gloss on all of now, furthermore, at this, even at the syntactic level, the order, ordering of words is deliberately made complicated, and I've given examples there of Timesis, ni di ish la dechver the dawn of div, and these are only some of the uh, complications in the in the wording for ni uh, div, right? Um, so I've given the, the, the normal uh, order in prose after the, the equal sign. Another onrath an instead of another an onrath, and olivan that they uh, with the, the prepose genitive, as, as the Jew of an olive. And then finally, for the metrical structure, this one, the metrical structure of this, does belong to a well-attested uh, type, which consists of two or three stress words per line, uh, with each connected to the following by alliteration. And I think that's enough to uh, show that, that this is highly complex. And uh, yet the data that you extract from this are, you know, uh, the Olaf is 24 and the Honor is 12 and he's right new. Right. Um, now, uh, to turn then to the other handout, a... Um, um, the subject matter of our passage is uh, fa fairly uh, familiar, at least in its main outlines. Now, the poetic character of the passage is shown by the Dunath, which is quite a complex one. Uh, uh, so you know, it begins, if you the, the, the handout, if you read out the, the section one there of it, I've, I've divided it into uh, ten sections. It's Moidthar Glasa I Edelsa. So the lawsuit of the church is like a sea obliterating small streams. Uh, this is a very powerful claim. Uh, uh, the lawsuit of the church is a most wonderful lawsuit. No countersuit answers it. It, that is, the church, is separate from everyone. Everyone is subject to it. It binds, it is not bound. It constrains, it is not constrained. It is appealed to, it does not appeal with regard to what is right in this world or the next. And the final section, uh, section 10 there, uh, ends with is muertar glasa, but also then uh, the... The first uh, sentence there, "Ad reitni arghar da imartni timargar bagyalter ni foitla," also echoes the uh, uh, the section one of the thing. So it's a complex donut. Though it's, um, it has something of the character and anyway, of, of um, uh, verse in that, the closure uh, and a complex one. The phrase "muertar uh, is a striking one as well, very uh, powerful image, and uh, I've given there in the the item on the handout. Um, uh, some other examples of it's used elsewhere in Breath and Nevis, Toshach, of the highest grade of king there in Eshelton, uh, Bordhar, Glasenshin. That person is the, like a sea obliterating small streams. 
but elsewhere. And I've taken my translation. The second example there is from a poem in the Christian Kings of Leinster, edited by uh, M. A. O'Brien. Uh, uh, so, uh, like a sea, uh, that's what I've taken the, my translation from. Uh, you get it in the town as well as Murtagh Glass of Dalanig on Eivor Ferchus. And then I've given some other similar, uh, but it's not tar, right, obliterating, but Moed Os Nasroth of Sire of, this is from an unpublished poem in the Book of Ivana on the Gospel. Um, and uh, this has got the preposition o, os uh, surpassing so a uh, sea surpassing the noble streams uh, the sun surpassing um, uh, splendid, the fine beautiful stars uh, the organ uh, surpassing every other uh, type of music and then the, so- the song of songs uh, uh, surpassing uh, 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 every other kind of song yes. All right, and then another one is tan duravara by this min glashe yes. uh, so this is uh, again, anyway, a very, um, a very powerful um, uh, uh, statement on the the lawsuit of the church. That is a case taken by an ecclesiastic. Beyond that, there is no immediate, uh, immediately obvious metrical pattern. So accordingly, we must divide it into the semantic units and then see where we get from there. Uh, as I see it, the text falls into ten sections, and uh, we have the f- the outer frame of this is sections one and then seven to ten which are concerned specifically with the lawsuit of the, uh, a, a lawsuit of the church, that is a lawsuit taken by an ecclesiastic, uh, its superiority. Right? Then within that you have a second inner frame, uh, which is uh, sec- uh, section 2 and section 6, uh, which are specifically concerned with stating that the, uh, they specifically state that the, the canon law, the law of the church, is superior to civil law or secular law. Right? Um, two and, six. and then the final, the core, then the inner core, is um, uh, sections three, four, and five. So you have a you know a complex pattern there, and uh, a complex envelope pattern uh, with a frame and a, uh, an inner frame, and then the core. So we can look at the core first. Um, uh, uh, well, so the, the the inner frame, I suppose, uh, uh, number number two, uh, and uh, uh, makes a um, a powerful. Um, um, uh, and unambiguous statement on the superiority of canon law to uh, civil or secular law. So, al fekara gair trom, a cliff against easy yet grievous sin, do kachdine rovalna sarbeth, and I think that is uh, for every person over whom the world has had held sway, and then contrast, ar bi as bith o rechterer, the church will be under the rule of its law, uh, of the church's law. Uh, and then this uh, phrase, rofes. This is a very powerful statement again, um, unambiguous. Rafes as vos feinichus gondel erbne. It is uh, certain that um, civil law is vain in comparison with the words of God. Uh, etc., where neither man is defrauded nor God neglected, as a result of which prosperity uh, increases. I've given item number four in the handout some other examples of that phrase, the amoket the moin, with which this uh, this ends. Now you will notice then that the the next section. Uh, three is moin is the final word of, uh, of section two connects with moin in section three which is specifically on the Eucharist the ho- doctrine, the host, the Eucharist uh, and this is moin mor so great treasure, small reflection the name of which is host um, ofla, the host uh, it is shamefulness and great recklessness uh, if a um, churchman falsifies it with his mouth uh, and uh, he will be for seven hard years uh, in severe penance. Now, I take the, here the which is uh, two meters four gun with the mouth. Uh, the uh, the Bible is uh, 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 to stand for all of the, the, the church teaching or dogma of the, uh, of the church. And I give him the handout there for the penance, uh, item number five in the handout from uh, uh, the Canonas Hibernenses, um, the penance, right, I mean, a number of other people, of course, who, um, who uh, get this penance, but anyway, one of them is the, the penance of a wizard, uh, one who has vowed himself to evil malefactors, one or of a heretic. Uh, seven years on bread and water, which is the seven years of um, uh, uh, severe uh, penance. Um, okay, um, and then the next two, four and five, are put into the uh, 
pro- uh, form of a prophecy of the coming of uh, Christianity. Um, and um, so you have the Amshir Irdan Tikva Talgen Tuatha. Uh, so there will be a time to come when the ads-headed one, or ads head is sometimes translated, will come to the peoples with swift lays in Latin, Kalaitha Vladna Luath Christ Chedva, and report of the Christian faith. Kanyot Noiv Fawitha Noiv Hithav Gyanav Karkoch. With the strength of saints and prophets, it, that is the faith, will be hallowed in the mouths of all. And then the next one. Uh, so... These prophecies, of course, are not hard to come by. Uh, just for example, on item six in the handout from a law text, the the other Athena, the Testament of Athena, um, uh, is a prophecy on the birth of Christ, uh, you know, putting the mouth of the mythical pre-Christian poet Athena, uh, combined with a set of injunctions from Athena to his pupils to behave in an upright and indeed proto-Christian uh, fashion. Um, the best known such prophecy is, of course, the next item on the, the handout. Um, um, the, uh, is the short poem from the life of Patrick, uh, item seven on the handout. Uh, the earliest attestation we have of this is from uh, Murdoch's li- life of Patrick, where you have the Latin version. This is presented uh, by Murdoch as a translation from the Irish. Um, so, adveniat, uh, adveniat aski caput is the one that renders tikva talgam. Right? Uh, this is the core phrase here. Um, uh, Beeler translates as a shaven head. Right? Anyway, so, um, anyway, adds head, right? um, uh, and so on. You have the translation there in front of you, um, and um, it finishes there. The, the uh, asua mensa uh, ex anteriore parte domus suae respondebit e sua familia tota uh, fiat fiat. So uh, uh, from his table, he will chant in piety from his um, um, uh, table in the front of his house. That's the eastern part of the house, I think you could uh, translate that, uh, uh, given the Irish R, uh, and all his people would answer, be it thus, be it thus. I think the fiat there might be uh, significant. Uh, the version in the Vita uh, Tripartite, as you can see, is quite close to that, but it's got two, two verses. In it. Um, so, Tic Fatalgen, um, uh, and then, Amias in Arthur, Tigia Friskera, the winter, Ila Amen, Amen, right? So, that has. Uh, 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 not fiat, but amen. And then the second, I give below that then at the bottom the translation by um, by Whitley Stokes. This is a very well known um, uh, uh, verse or uh, pair of verses. Um, okay, um, it's also um, 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 uh, ref- um, uh, referred to or the, 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 in Fiox Him, right? uh, this, this prophecy, Tuatha Eir in Tarchandish, Das Nikveth, Shidlath, Nuah. Uh, the peoples of Ireland used to prophesy that a new pr- prince of peace would come to them, um, and so on. Uh, and then the second verse in this, His uh, wizards used not to hide from him Patrick's coming. Now, uh, interestingly, in the, uh, in the gloss on, on that, uh, in the 11th century manuscript of the Liber Hymnorum, Adruid for Leuchere, uh, the glossator cites the uh, the verse from the Vita Tripartita, and so the, uh, he sees the, the connection there. And in the case of our text, we have we have tikva tikva talgan tuatha. Right? Um, now, certainly tikva talgan must be an echo of the verse in the life of Patrick. Uh, it echoes the opening line of the of the the, the verse. Um, so as the Latin version of this verse is attested in Murdoch's life, which is dated to the late 7th century, the reference to the text of the eight, in the text of the 8th century Breath and Neveth is clearly an allusion to or derivative from the earlier text. And this raises the further interesting possibility that the mention of fiad in, uh, fiad in se- se- uh, um, uh, section 5, in the second line, um, uh, is an echo of the end of the verse in Murdoch, that is, specifically of the Latin text rather than the Irish while Murdoch uh, presents his verse as a translation, the version in the Vita Tripartita may in fact be a rendering of this back into Old Irish again, rather than uh, represent the original form uh, from which the Latin purports to have been uh, translated. Uh, furthermore, when we, the, uh, the, um, uh, the line in Fiox him as well, the fact that you have Tuatha Eirin Tarchandish, there's surely, but I would say, they argue that there is a connection there. You have Tik Fatal Gan Tuatha. Um, uh, there is some textual connection there. Uh, again, we'll come back to that in, uh, in, uh, later on. 
Right. Um, now, this prophecy, of course, differs from the uh, the others in its uh, in its concentration or focus on the law of the church. The other ones are prophecies, general prophecies of the coming of Christianity. This is specifically about the uh, the, uh, the, the 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 law of co- co- concentration, and this comes out not so much in section four. That's that's the coming of Christianity, but in section five, and, and this is the very core of it. Right? Section five and six. Uh, so in section five, uh, uh, be, so there are, be after a time the giving of a pledge to ward off a bell sound with hallelujah, with fiat, lords will bend because of its assets of truth to the church. Uh, for it, uh, sort of make everybody bend to its will, uh, for it is totally immune from any claim by any person. Uh, falsehood will be spurned. The arbitration of the layman will be eclipsed. So again, uh, uh, secular law will be eclipsed by uh, canon law. Um, this section five is concerned now. What, what this thing, the, 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 the bells sound, hallelujah, and fiat, and so on, refers to is the uh, the, the ritual of malediction, uh, a procedure employed by the church as a um, as a, a last resort. Uh, item number eight on the handout, um, I've given there a reference to from Bellin's call. There's a uh, the, that phrase "fria Kimball moth," where their Kimball bell is in the genitive plural. Um, that could well be again an echo of our text, uh, you know, that is preceded by the the Talgan. Uh, um, now, uh, this ritual, um, um, as Paul de Grenail, the the uh, last two items there in um, um, uh, uh, handout eight, uh, Paul de Grenail, a middle Irish poem, the maledictory psalms, and then a, a discussion of this ritual of malediction by Dan Wiley in Parisia 15. <coughs> are the the essential references for that. Um, uh, this is going to be, as Padre Gonel states in the article on the handout, and that's page 41, three elements can be distinguished in this ritual. An assembly of clerics, the ringing of bells, and the chanting of psalms. The procedure in its broad outlines is parallel to those of distraint for commoners and satire for poets, uh, and it's discussed in detail by Wiley. Uh, I've given there, a, in the middle of that, the piece of, um, uh, from the, the old Irish glossing on the Chanachas Mall. Uh, after Patrick and the nobles of the men of Ireland had established this law, it is then that they decided how they will levy their due from those who commit offences against them. Now, these are uh, last resorts to be employed, different forms of last resort to be employed by different form, types of person. So, bell and psalm for the church. Right? So, that's the bell right? and the chanting of psalms. Right? Uh, so, that's the Kimball Goth and Connella and Kobiel is a way of, uh, you know, the, uh, that, that's referring to the chanting of the psalms. And, um, um, uh, so Gael, the lot of um, 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 hostages for lords, uh, the three utterances for poets. This is a poem of mixed praise and satire, part of the ritual of satire and distraint for commoners. Um, and I've discussed this in the, the article there on satire and the poet circus, circus. You can get further details on that, uh, uh, this um, procedure for the uh, for the poets. And, of course, we'll get a full account of distraint in uh, Fergus Kelly's Guide to Early Irish Law. Now, what all these procedures have uh, in common is a process of mounting pressure, which affords every opportunity to the defendant to settle the claim before the final step is taken. So the final step in the case of the poet is you satirise the person. In the, the final sta- stage in the, um, in the process of distraint is that the person's property, which is distrained, usually cattle, uh, is forfeit. And the final uh, stage in the ritual of malediction is the actual malediction itself. Um, okay, and here again, so this, this then is the coming of Christianity and then uh, reference to the last resort uh, employed by the church uh, when, uh, when it g- fails to gain satisfaction, or an ecclesiastic, um, when it g- fails to gain satisfaction in any other way. Uh, number six, uh, comes back to the then theme, specifically the theme of uh, 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 well, it begins at the end of it. It picks, picks up on the last line of a uh, uh, section five, the arbitration of the layman, which is where I translate Fena here as a crude translation of that, uh, will be eclipsed, right? um, and uh, so it picks up on that again. Which, of course, this is the inner frame, the specific superiority of uh, of canon law to civil law, and uh, so it is not to a lord that adventures to speak. That is the church. Uh, because uh, it is not in the assembly of laymen that the first stream of truth is settled. For the lawsuit of the church is founded on rocks of righteousness. And that brings us back again to that recurrent uh, phrase, I, Eglitza, an ecclesiastical lawsuit, or a lawsuit of the church. 
Uh, and then uh, we get finally the, the, um, the, the uh, section 7, coming back then to the section 7, 8, and 9, and 10, uh, all dealing with the, uh, the lawsuit of the church, and uh, uh, that it is the uh, uh, that this is uh, uh, most um, um, the superior. Right? Um, now, this the, uh, the the ecclesiastical lawsuits, and specifically ecclesiastical lawsuits, is important evidence, of course, for the claim for preferential treatment for clerics before the law uh, was at least of as much concern in early medieval Ireland uh, as in the medieval European Church in general. Uh, indeed, we may we may compare the opening of Creith um, uh, uh, Goblock, section ten on the handout. Um, um, section nine there is just for an, another example of Ale, the the, the hallelujah. Um, uh, but anyway, section ten there uh, is the the uh, opening of Creith Goblock, uh, where in paragraph two of Creith Goblock, the very reason why the various classes of persons should be divided into grades at all is addressed and says, on what basis have the lay grades been divided? On the basis of correspondence with the grades of the church. For any grade which there is in the church, it is right that there be a corresponding one amongst the laity for the sake of proving by oath or denial on oath or of evidence or of judgment of one to the other. This, again, is, of course, concerned with an ecclesiastic uh, taking a case or being involved in uh, uh, litigation with a, uh, a layman. Here, again, primacy is given to ecclesiastical lawsuits of course, this is not to be taken as an explanation of the origins of class, distinct, class distinctions. Uh, its real significance lies in the fact that it offers a reason why the church and its institutions ought to take an interest at all in uh, differences of status. And uh, thankfully, they did, as, uh, otherwise we wouldn't have these, uh, uh, this rich uh, corpus of status texts uh, surviving from the, the old Irish period. Now, in section seven, then, the, the, the common motif of the sevenfold church is alluded to. You, know, you have the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, the seven graves, and then finally the Shech Nan Olive. On seven uh, breathings, the lawsuit of the church will be pro prosecuted. Evel, the, the, the future of Achiz I is to pursue a case. And um, uh, uh, this is brought into connection with the principle that the length of the statement one could make before a court depended on one's status. This is a well-attested principle and is mentioned elsewhere in Bethan Evith Toshach. It's mentioned in Creith Goblach and elsewhere. I cite an example there on the handout from uh, Middle Irish Commentary, simply because it's in a more straightforward language than the passages in the Bethan Evith Toshach on this, but it says roughly the same thing. Um, uh, seven breathings for the ecclesiastic and seven phrases in each bre breathing. Three breathings for the Lord and seven phrases in each breathing. Two breathings for the poet. I presume breathing is as much as you can say uh, without having to draw breath. You know? um, and five phrases in each breathing, and a single breathing for the commoners, and five phrases in it. So uh, the higher your status. And again, the one with the, uh, the longest statement is the church. This is uh, uh, the I, Egelsa, is superior to, to any other one. Uh, this indeed, this statement and this classification into, uh, into breathings is in fact a practical application of the pl claim made in our text that is Muerta Glasa Ai Agulsa. Um, section 10 then is uh, almost identical to the uh, opening apart from lines 3 to 4 of section 10 that is Fortang for Koch, Ni Fortang Koch Farra, Dar Koch Fri'e Sarsha for Koch. So um, um, it overswears everyone. No one else overswears it. Everyone is base in relation to it. It is free in relation to all others. And then it is like a sea, obliterating uh, streams. That uh, item 12 there on the handout, um, a, uh, a passage from the Collectio Canon of Hebridensis, CCH, uh, Book 42, Chapter 27. Um, this closely echoes the... Uh, 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 this statement here. It's, uh, it's given as, as a, um, uh, the source of it is given as a synodus hibernensis, uh, Aris Synod, Ecclesia enum habit potestandum, potestatum legandi et solveni. So the church then has the power of uh, binding and loosing, and it is free, right? and everyone uh, is a debtor right? uh, towards it. So that is saying in Latin, saying the same thing that our, that our text is. And that's the, the only the this is the principal difference between section 10 and section 1 is that phrase, uh, which is, I, I would argue anyways, a, 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 an old Irish rendering of that sentence in the 
Calexio uh, Canon uh, Hibernensis. Right, uh, now if we go back then to the, the action, the handout A, the first page there, um, uh, another point uh, that's worth noting is that our text would uh, seem to have been a fairly well known part of, uh, of Breath and Abbot Toshach, going by the extracts cited from it elsewhere. Um, so I've given them there on the, the handout. Uh, it's cited in uh, you know, various digests, legal digests. Cited in O'Davern's glossary and elsewhere, and perhaps uh, the 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 phrase "rofes is false feinichus gondel erbne," which is in uh, section two, uh, the second second last line in section two. This uh, got a, a particularly um, uh, good um, um, uh, circulation, uh, as as is cited in both Sanus Cormac, the Cormac's glossary there, which I have ferb. This is in an entry on the word ferb, meaning word. Right, uh, uh, ferb means word. It can have other meanings, uh, uh, as is, and then cites this as an example of it, meaning meaning word, right? and uh, comics glossary, late ninth century. Uh, but also, the word ferb occurs in the Abra uh, Golem uh, and in the Scolia, or glosses on the commentary on that. Uh, again, it's uh, our phrase is cited uh, in a similar Ut dicitur rufes is false feinachus a gundel erbne. Uh, that's in the, the version edited by Stokes and Review Celtic uh, 20 from uh, Robinson B502. Uh, the version of the Abra in, uh, in Lara Nahira has a, has a slightly um, uh, abbreviated version of this. Right? But uh, as, as, of course, the, the large number of copies of the, uh, of the Abra uh, are in existence. So this got a particularly uh, wide um, uh, uh, circ circulation. Um, now, while much more uh, could be said on the, the matter, I trust that what, we, uh, what I've said so far today will, will suffice to show the sophistication of this uh, composition. But it cannot, of course, be assumed that all other passages in these rhetorical texts will have the same predetermined shape with closure, envelope patterns, and so on. Further research uh, will doubtless reveal other patterns, but we can at least be certain that none of them will be simple. Um, and our text is also a good illustration of the interconnection between the law texts and other forms of early Irish literature and writing in general. Certainly the phrase tikva talgen tuatha in uh, section 4 uh, echoes the verse in the life of Patrick. And section 10, the, uh, the forteng for koch, um, is uh, a <coughs> translation of the uh, a phrase in the Calexio Canon of Hebronensis. Uh, there's also, I think, clearly a connection between fiox hymn and uh, Breath and Toshach. But whether Fiach's hymn is echoing Breath and Toshach or Breath and Toshach is echoing Fiach's hymn is uncertain. In the case of the item on, uh, on handout number eight there, which is the, the balance call, um, uh, it is more likely that uh, Breath and Toshach is the original and balance call has the, e that balance call has the echo. It is to be hoped that further research uh, on the date of Fiach's hymn will enable us to draw firmer conclusions uh, and in this context, I would like to stress, uh, lay stress on the importance of striving at all times to anchor earlier Irish texts uh, insofar as possible in time and place. Such a historical-based approach will certainly lead to more satisfactory um, uh, uh, insights than, uh, than uh, satisfying ourselves with the vague concept of a Gaelic tradition. And finally, the strong claims made for the importance of canon law and the subordination of secular law uh, to it are particularly striking in a vernacular text which is to such a large degree concerned with the poets, the judges and the lawyers. Uh, while Breton Evans Toshach as a whole is dressed up as a piece of ancient tradition with the bulk of sections 2 and 3 cast in the form of dialogues between the prehistoric and mythical jurist uh, uh, modern and his pupil Neda. In fact, it is firmly rooted in the contemporary issues of the time of its composition. Thank you.